Okay. Hi. Okay. Hello. Hi. Andrew Payne will be speaking first. He's Head of Education and Outreach at the UK National Archives. I'm just going to introduce you in Hebrew, Andrew. Okay. Um, Andrew Payne, um, Manahel, Trum, Hinoch, Kishre, Kila, Varchion, Alumia, Briti, Sham, Mumavil, Atapitoch, Vangasha, Cheshrutim, Lomorim, Studentim, Mishbachot, Futsot, Shonot, Bekila. Baltor, Rishon, Bistoria, Shilimea, Benaim, Vaeta, Hadasha, Universal at Liverpool. Andrew Gum, Avarsham, Achshara, Kamorele, Historia, the technology at Medavit, Shoret, Vahakach, Lamad, the Tor, Shinib, Melasakim. Andrew Limed, Historia, Politica, Babet Sefer Tihon. פיתח תוכנה חינוכית והכשיר מורים עד להצטרפותו לצוות העובדים בארכיון הלאומי הבריטי בשנת 2006. בשנת 2013 הוא מונה לחבר באגודה ההיסטורית הבריטית בשל תרומתו לתחום של חינוך היסטורי. כמו כן, הוא אחד ממייסדי תוכנית ההכשרה השנתית של בית הספר החורף הבינלאומי לארכיונאות, בה משתמשים באוספים ארכיונים ופרויקטים של חינוך ובריאות הציבור. ההרצאה שונה קצת מההרצאה המקורית, עם יותר דגש על חינוך, והכותרת של ההרצאה היא לתת השראה לעתיד ההיסטוריה, שינוי גישה בתי ספר להוראות העבר. Andrew's lecture is slightly different from the original one that was advertised, as entitled Inspiring the Future of History, Changing the Way Schools Think About Teaching the Past. Andrew, please. Thank you, Rachel, and uh, good afternoon. Shalom. And uh, thank you for your invitation to present to you. Uh, can I just check that everybody can see my presentation screen? Good, fantastic. And uh, we'll get started. So I want to talk to you today about um, the uh, education service that we have at the National Archives here at the UK and the approach that we take uh, to using that collection for the teaching of history. And um, we have over the past 20 years, we've developed a particular pedagogy towards using the archives. And it's one that we wish to encourage uh, teachers in schools mm -hmm. to adopt and to use as well. So um, we are uh, trying to build a quiet revolution from below <laughs> through archives and through the use of um, documents. And it's really based around this question of how does a six year old know about history? Um, in fact, let me ask you another question. How does the 16 year old know about history? Or indeed, um, how does a 66 year old know about history? Um, I suppose really we could ask, how does anybody know about history at all? Um, and a final question for you is, do you believe that the answer to each of those questions is different? Or do you believe, as we do at the National Archives, that the answer fundamentally should be the same for everyone, whether they're six, 16, 66, an experienced academic or a first time student? Because we believe that history is an active investigation of the past and not simply a passive story about past events. We know about the past by discovering it through a process of active inquiry, which begins with a question, leads us into the archives to investigate documents, extract evidence, interpret it, and present the findings in a compelling story. This is the process that we encourage all students to undertake that visit our workshops and use our materials online. Last year, we taught over 15,000 students from the age of six years to undergraduate level. 10,000 students came to visit us at our site in London, and a further 5,000 students connected to us through our live remote teaching service. In addition, we received over 3 million visits to the education section of the National Archives website. And in fact, that's one tenth of all visits to the National Archives website last year were to the education section. Now, this process isn't without its critics, and there's actually a huge debate in Britain about how schools should teach history. It's often presented as something of a false dichotomy between skills and knowledge. Uh, critics arguing that inquiry-based learning is ineffective and an extravagant waste of time that doesn't even accurately replicate, replicate the process that historians undertake. 
So in the interest of fairness, um, I've provided a link to uh, one of uh, my leading critics. We um, debate vociferously, particularly on Twitter, um, about this issue. But uh, you can uh, read his article afterwards, uh, Michael Fordham, um, about why he believes that um, the process that we undertake and, and the uh, approach that we advocate for um, is not the right one. Um, so for those of you that uh, are still with me and uh, not reading Michael Fordham's blog, um, let me tell you a little bit more about our approach and why we do what we do. First of all, we start early um, with six-year-olds. Uh, so one of our most popular workshops that we run at the archives is about the Great Fire of London. And it feels like every six-year-old in the country um, learns about the Great Fire of London. The curriculum requires them to study a significant event uh, in the past as an introduction to history, and most schools seem to pick about the catastrophic fire that destroyed 80% of the medieval city of London in 1666. Now, primary pupils who come to the workshop already know a huge amount about the fire, where and how it started, why it spread so quickly, and raged for three days, and how it was eventually put out. So we don't actually intend to teach them anything new about the events of the fire. In fact, we begin by asking them to tell us the story. Um, and then we ask them, how do you know that? To which they respond, our teacher told us, or we watched it on TV, or it was in the book or on the computer. So then we ask, but how did the person who wrote that book or made that program know? And then we throw the, the curveball, as we say, the challenging question at them. How do we know what happened 350 years ago? Now, if I'm in the room, they'll often look at me as if to say, well, maybe we could ask him. Um, but once we've established that I'm not a friend to dinosaurs, then uh, you can see a look of panic come over their faces as they begin to worry about how do we know if anything in the past really happened at all? It really is quite something to see a class of six-year-olds having an existential crisis. So we begin to talk to them about how we find out if a great fire took place and if there really was a place called Pudding Lane and a baker called Thomas Fariner. And they begin to suggest the kinds of documents that might be useful. Um, documents like this one, for example. This is Wenceslas Holler's map from 1667, showing the area of the city that was destroyed by the fire. And it includes a wonderful prospect of the city as seen from the south side of the River Thames, showing the fire raging across the city um, there in the top left-hand corner. So beginning with that map, we then introduce them to other documents and we give them facsimiles to work with to find the evidence for the events about which they already know. We then build up to the grand finale in the workshop, which is what is happening actually in this photograph that you can see here. Um, these are six-year-olds who have been looking in awe and wonder at something quite remarkable. And it's not a superhero or a power ranger. It's not even a Pokemon. It's a 17th century tax document. So this is a half tax return. The half tax was one of those ingenious ways that 17th century governments found for working out how wealthy someone was by counting up the number of fireplaces or hearths that they had in their house. The bigger the house, the greater number of rooms and the greater number of fireplaces. So the more tax you were liable to pay. But this is not just any half tax return. This is the actual one for Pudding Lane, which shows Thomas Farriner's bakery with its five hearths and one oven, which is the exact place where the great fire broke out. You would not believe the excitement that this document causes. I have literally heard children squeal with excitement, but more importantly, it creates a powerful learning experience which transforms their understanding of what history is and how it is studied. And 
I believe it's essential that we do transform students' understanding of what history is by giving them the opportunity to work with archival material. We need them to understand that archives are the laboratory for the historian. This is where and how history is done. But many students and many teachers as well have no real experience of archives or how to use what they contain. I often talk about how the archives um, is actually like a time machine. Um, if you know the uh, BBC series Doctor Who, you'll know that uh, he travels through space and time in something called the TARDIS, which is a small police box, um, but miraculously is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, and it allows him to travel around the universe through space and time. And I, I describe the archives like this, because our archive is around a quarter of a mile um, if you walk around the outside of the building, but if you come inside, we have around 160 miles of shelves. So it is quite literally bigger on the inside than on the outside. And it also allows you to travel around a thousand miles of world, oh, sorry, a thousand years of world history. But for many, what an archive is, is uh, something unknown to them. Even history teachers rarely visit archives. In 2014, the University of Exeter undertook some research into the teaching of the First World War, and they asked 200 history teachers the question, which of these have you taken your students to for a First World War related field trip? 70% said that they had been to a battlefield. 11% said that they had been to a national museum. 6% said they'd used a local memorial. 5% had been to the theatre. 4% to a local museum. And only 1%, that's two history teachers out of 200, said that they had taken them to an archive. Incidentally, those two teachers that had taken groups to an archive had brought them to the National Archives. So hurrah, we're doing something right. <laughs> but consequently, this means that students don't really understand about sources. Um, sources are often presented as um, just random extracts in school textbooks that are decontextualized, often shortened, um, and don't really appear in their original format. And I think many students think that sources are something that were just made up to make their lives miserable. Um, that's certainly the case for this student who is struggling to answer the source based question in her exam that she has to take at 16. It really does create a real problem for students and their understanding of what history is. And this is a letter that is written to a good friend of mine who is the chief examiner for one of the school examination boards in England. He sets the exams for 16 year olds that uh, um, take for history and oversees the examiners who mark them. And every year he receives letters written by students who are sat in an examination hall and don't know what to do with the source based question. And this is what this particular student says. In my opinion, I don't see how sources are testing students on their knowledge of the history they have been studying, as if you don't get the message of the source, then you aren't going to be able to answer the question correctly. So in future, I think personally, it would be better to be examined in a different way. Even if I did know all there was to know on the subject, then I still wouldn't get a good grade as I didn't get the source. It would be simpler to just ask questions and answer them in full, just being tested like that. And let me just say that there are many, like Michael Fordham and others, who would agree with her, those who argue that the role of the history teacher is not to really make students think and understand so much as just to learn and be able to recite knowledge um, long enough until they can write it down on an exam paper. But then comes the key question that, uh, or the key statement that shows that this student really has no idea what history is about. History is hard enough without having sources as well, as you have a lot to learn in such a short time. 
please take what I wrote in consideration. Many thanks. Now, my, my heart bleeds for that student because after 11 years of studying history at school, they have absolutely no idea what the point of the document is. And that statement, history is hard enough without having sources as well. You know, no, history is impossible without sources. And yet this student doesn't understand that. But in many ways, it's not their fault. It's because they've never had the opportunity to do real history. She's been taken on trips to battlefields and museums, to memorials and even to the theatre, but she's never been taken to an archive or had the opportunity to work with archival material in an authentic way, where she has to try and discover something about the past in order to answer a question. So, the power of archives comes from their ability to make us think. They challenge our preconceptions about the past and they provoke us to ask questions about what we think we know. And that is essential because thinking is the key to memory. If we want our students to learn and to remember history, then we need to make them think and think hard, really hard, because memory is the residue of thought, as Professor Daniel Willingham says. Daniel Willingham is a professor of cognitive psychology at the University of Virginia and in his book Why Don't Students Like School, which is a terrible title for a great book, he writes about nine things that his research has revealed about the process of learning and what is happening in children's minds. And I think his chapter on memory is particularly interesting. As he says, your memory is not the product of what you want to remember or what you try to remember, it's the product of what you think about. So if we want our students to remember the history that we are teaching them, we need to get them to think about it hard. And archives are brilliant for making you think hard. That's why I say that history is a verb, not a noun. And I know that really annoys language teachers, <laughs> but it's true. The word history literally means inquiry. It's an active investigation of the past, which begins with a question, leads us into the archives to find documents, to find the evidence we need to interpret and present our answer. The narrative story that we tell at the end is just the final step of the process. So let's not pretend that our, to our students that history is just a passive narrative. It is not. It's an active and ongoing investigation and debate about the past. So, to support students in their use of our collection, we are guided by three key principles, which is inspire, challenge and support. We inspire them with access to original documents. We challenge them to use those to work in an authentic way and we support them so that they can draw their own conclusions and write their own authentic historical accounts. We do this in two hour workshops um, at the archives that we run and some 10,000 students uh, visit us for those workshops each year. And we are increasing the numbers of students year on year up until the current situation, but I'll talk about that later. Um, we also do live remote teaching sessions to schools using video conferencing. Um, supported by preparation material which is available from the website for teachers to download in advance. And then we have a live um, interactive debate and discussion. And we always show them real documents via the camera during those sessions. And in addition, we are now using Blackboard Collaborate, Microsoft Teams, Google Classroom and Zoom as live interactive teaching environments where students log in individually with their classes to interact with our education officers and work with digital copies of documents. In total, we teach around 5,000 students through our remote teaching services each year. And in fact, since the lockdown, we have hugely increased the numbers of students that we are teaching through this platform. Um, we actually expect, because we are not doing any live on-site teaching due to the, um, the COVID crisis, we have 
hugely increased the numbers of sessions that we offer for remote live teaching. And we think that we may actually be able to teach the same number of students, around 15,000 students remotely, without having done any on-site teaching at all by the time we get to the end of our business year in March. Just this last month, um, we taught over 3,000 students in one month through our virtual classrooms. Our education resources are freely available to all teachers and students, and we receive over 3 million visits a year and around 1 million downloads of resources. Our website is consistently rated as the third most used digital resource by history teachers in the UK after YouTube and BBC History. It's also extremely well used around the world. Around a third of our users come from um, North America and a third come from the rest of the world. In 2015, we were commissioned by the UK Parliament to develop an online experience to mark the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. The resulting resource combined an innovative use of original documents, video instruction and authentic inquiry to enable students to investigate the development of Magna Carta over the 13th century at four key points in 1215, 1225, 1265 and 1297. The resource won two international awards for outstanding innovation in the use of digital technology for learning. And in the same year, it led us to develop our Magna Carta Day for schools, where we threw open the archives to 200 students and brought the characters and the documents to life from the website. Staff from across the organization supported documents in their investigation of Magna Carta. One thing I particularly love about um, this picture is um, uh, the, the man showing the documents here, Bipin, um, is neither a, a, an archivist nor a member of our education team. Um, he was a volunteer for the day who works in human resources, but we brought people from across the organization because we had so many students on site, we um, and my education team alone couldn't uh, handle them. We had volunteers from across the whole of the organization helping out. And we gave them little instruction sheets on how to become a teacher for the day. In addition, we partnered with Discovery Education to deliver a live broadcast to schools around the world. And in total, 270,000 students in over 3,500 schools from 20 countries around the world participated in the live broadcast including several schools in Israel. It really was uh, the most phenomenal um, experience. We also provide professional development for teachers and archivists. We work with over 2000 history teachers each year to develop their classroom practice in the use of archival collections. We also work with archivists to develop their skills in using their own collections for education. We also partner with universities to deliver what we call teacher scholarship programmes, including this one that you can see here from the University of York about migration during the medieval period. These enable teachers to engage and work with academic historians who are undertaking research based on the records in our collection. The teachers follow an in-depth study programme about the research for 12 weeks, including two residential weekends, and then they produce downloadable resources, which are hosted on our website for use by students in the classroom. We're also developing more creative responses to our collections. Our summer school programs for students provide opportunities to work with film animators, illustrators, and writers to produce outstanding films, graphic novels, and creative writing. In 2017, our Song Tales film won an international award for best student generated film at the Medea Awards in Brussels. And Suffrage Tales was shortlisted for the final as well in 2018. It's been a 20 year process of continual development to get this far in our education service and it would not have been possible without the support of our chief executive and the directors over the years not only in supporting but in actively encouraging it. Indeed, our whole corporate strategy since 2015 
has adopted the idea of inspiring new audiences to think differently about archives. This has required us to rethink our corporate structure so that we can be more focused on our audiences and their needs rather than being organized around the functions of our organization as a traditional archive. So we have four, uh, five directorates in total, um, one for each of the key audiences. Um, so we have one for government who provide us with our collection, uh, a directorate for the archive sector for whom we provide leadership and support, another directorate for academics with whom we work on unlocking the research potential of our collection, and then a public engagement directorate which includes my department for schools, teachers, families, and community groups, as well as our marketing, exhibitions, and events, and record specialists. Running through the middle of that, we have our digital directorate, which is working on delivering digital solutions to our greatest challenges. And while digital represents the greatest challenge for all archives around the world, it also offers huge opportunities. And there was this was no more apparent than in March 2019 when we had to close the National Archives as a result of the lockdown implemented by the UK government in response to the global coronavirus pandemic. We were closed for three months. And to be honest, we didn't know exactly when we were going to reopen. Suddenly, we could no longer provide workshops and other programs for our 15,000 students and 2,000 teachers and for the growing numbers of family and community audiences. So we had to find a solution and find it fast. Our response, however, was immediate and highly creative. On the 23rd of April, that's just four weeks after we closed, we launched Time Travel TV to offer video-based lessons for homeschoolers. And I'm so proud of how my team responded to this challenge, offering engaging and clearly structured lessons within four weeks of the national lockdown. The only other organization to respond so quickly was the BBC. So I think we did really well. We are now producing a series of videos called History Hook, which provides a short introduction to our popular online lessons in a similar way that a classroom teacher would do. This offers better engagement, guidance and support for students uh, who are required to work at home during periods of COVID isolation. And many teachers also find it offers an engaging start to their own lessons by providing a direct link to the archives and documents that the students are working with. We believe that archives need to be used to be useful and that age should not be a barrier to their use. Students have as much right to the collection as everyone else. If we want our collection to be used by more people, then we must invest in inspiring, challenging and supporting the young people of today to become our audience of the future. And we must always remember that the expert in anything was once a beginner. Thank you very much. Wow. I'm jealous, very jealous. Um, thank you for your fascinating lecture, Andrew, with all its insights into your activities um, and the rationale behind them. I'm, I was at the archives, National Archives in January this year, and I had absolutely no idea that all that was going on around me. But, well, um, interestingly enough, we did meet the idea of the um, archive as a laboratory this morning in one of our lectures. Um, so it's interesting that the ideas in common um, you've definitely given us not all much food for thought, and I hope it inspires our archivists and our teachers to take up the challenge. I just said in Hebrew, Andrew, מעניין רק לציין שגם היום בבוקר באחד ההרצאות ההרצאה של איתי היה לנו גם כן הרעיון של המעבדה, הארכיון כמעבדה להיסטוריה, כמו שאנדו אמר. נתת לנו הרבה חומר למחשבה ואני מקווה שההרצאה תיתן השראה לארכיונאים ולמורים בארץ כדי להרים את הכפפה. תודה רבה.